super important to how we organize the class and to your learning. I'm going to start some new material today that I think you'll find interesting. One of the things you'll see sometimes are side effects or mutations. So I want to remind you, we will study them, but please do not use side effects or mutations, that is setter functions in scheme on problem set six for the final. We don't want to see those. And in addition, we will be talking some about arrays and we talked about hashing and expected value sum and recitation. Please do not use hash tables for answering questions about sets. Uh, we don't want you to do that. It's not that it's a bad technique, but it's not what we're focusing on. Uh, hash tables are implemented in Scheme, but don't use them for answering questions that aren't about hash tables. For instance, questions about sets today, but what we'll be doing. Um, so I want to spend the next and last three lectures on some examples of algorithm design. And there is a topic area, basically two kinds of foci. One is robotics, which is of course super cool. And the other is the kind of questions that you might get on coding interviews or interviews for jobs. Um, so there are a lot of puzzles associated with discrete mathematics in this class in particular. Now, when we used to teach these puzzles, they were pretty good preparation for these interviews. Now, of course, a lot of alumni of this class and other people have gone to Silicon Valley and New York City and Boston and so forth. And some of these questions are actually asked, which is somewhat unfortunate because the primary thing we're trying to teach is how to think through these questions, not memorize the answers. But nevertheless, I think it's useful to see these kind of questions and you will encounter some of these pretty frequently in those interviews if you go on in computer science. Um, so I'll try to do something about the kind of puzzles that we're, we're talking about. Um, so let's go to the document camera and we will do some math related to these questions and some computer science. Share screen. All right, so if this is correctly set up, you should be able to see me and see the document. Is that Your the Your camera is not on. There it is, now it's on. Yeah, so it turned off briefly. I'm sorry about that. I must have tapped it twice, but thank you. That's great. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about some, I mean, most students enjoy this because we finally get to see mutations and setter functions. We'll talk about them. So the example with computational geometry, I try to specialize this little bit to robotics because everyone likes robots. Um, we'll talk about circular lists and some puzzles. And these are interesting questions. So what you can think of this is I'm gonna, and maybe you'll come up with the answers with some help from me. And of course you could design to some extent algorithms and software before this course, but the idea is to sort of discover how now that you know more, mathematics for computer science, how that exercise is informed by your new knowledge and probably will go better. So let's take an example here. Um, and to put this sort of in context, uh, if we look at the idea of what programs mean, semantics. So we concentrated a lot on functional programs. And these programs have the substitution model. So that plus induction lets you cover all the recursive and iterative programs and prove they're correct in certain cases. But of course, there are also programs that have side effects or mutations. And there the substitution model won't work. And you need an extension of this called the environment model. Which is known to some of you as stack frames. It's actually covered very nicely in Abelson and Sussman. We won't do it in this class. You might do it in a later class. It's just as rigorous, but it takes account of all the, all the possible mutations and setter functions that you could use. Now, another thing we alluded to last time was the idea of probabilistic programs. So the context here, these are deterministic programs. No randomness, they always do the same thing. Probabilistic programs can call the random function, for example. 
And there you also need an extension of the substitution model, sometimes called the probabilistic lambda cal calculus. Now, we're going to stick with the substitution model. We're not gonna do the environment model in this class, but you can read about it. We're not gonna do probabilistic programs, but this is the sort of beginning of the world of structure of programs. But I am gonna talk about side effects today and how we can reason about those fairly rigorously. So let's go back to our example from computational geometry. We had these polygons. So here's a pentagon here, and we represented a polygon like this as a list of rational coordinates. And we talked about singly linked lists, which are nicely implemented for you. And we talked about a couple of different ways to implement these, if you think about it. So one of the first things we were able to do as we talked about this, we were able to, uh, you know, we were able to implement these using higher order functions. So let me just remind you of what we did there. We didn't really need any fancy new things on data structures. Given that we knew about high order procedures and Lambda, we actually could take the contract for cons and which is here, and we could implement that directly using higher order procedures. So in some sense to have singly linked lists in scheme, we didn't need any new constructs, no new syntax, nothing else. We just needed to be able to define procedures. And you should definitely understand how this implementation of cons satisfies the contract and fully gives us everything we need in terms of data structures. However, as we sort of get into this, it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, there are other ways of implementing this. And we also gave you a storage model. And you can sort of see the storage model sketched here as a box of pointer diagrams and imagine allocating cons pairs and setting pointers. With the miraculous magic that is implemented in Scheme, you never can have a dangling pointer. You never can have a memory leak and everything is taken care of for you. So I want to go a little bit deeper to talk about how these things are actually implemented and how we can make more fancy data structures. So this is the right idea, but let's just go into some detail and flesh it out. And to do that, we basically need the notion, I'll call this sort of 2A, of what we call a memory model. And you could think of the memory model as being an array. So we might have this enormous array of memory like this. We can visualize it the following sense, this is M. And if we look at the ith entry, there might be some value in that memory and say so that was you know, 24 stored there and scheme has arrays, they're implemented very nice. And in fact, to use that, you would say array reference. Uh, well, AREF, AREF um, M, I, that's short form for array ref M, I. And this would give you 24. And there's also a command to set that value, deposit the 24 in there. So we can have arrays and the arrays can be thought of as memory locations that you can store things in and take things out. Of course, they have finite width, so to speak. They can hold sort of one word. So what I'd like to do now is go to our model here and our notion that these could be actually implemented with an array or memory model and see what that might look like and how we can build data structures and answer some questions about these things. Okay, so in short, we had a contract for linked lists or singly linked lists. We could implement them with higher order procedures. Also, we could imagine them being implemented under the hood with the same contract using storage model and an array would let you do that. Let's be more specific about what I mean by an array would let you do that. And we can get into data structures a little bit. I know you've taken a class in data structures, but I, when I say data structures, I mean some mathematical questions about data structures. So remember that our, the thing we're trying to get at here is we, we know that we might think of a list as being the same box and pointer diagram we had before. We have one, two, three, and that's our box and pointer model for the list one, two, three. So how about we actually implement a singly linked list using our memory model, like allocating slots in memory and putting things in here and so forth. And one way to do that or to visualize that might be something like this. So here's sort of a singly linked list. What we might imagine doing is having these, I'm sort of drawing just, if you will, bigger boxes, right? 
and I'm rearranging them a little bit differently. I'm going to put the top box like this. So they're kind of stacked vertically instead of horizontally in this diagram. And in here, I'm going to have data. And here's other data called the D2, here are all data three, data four. And of course, there's a length to what those can be. But in our example here, that you might imagine the data is the pair xi, yi in our example. And of course, it's a pointer to that. You're not actually putting the data in there. So the data will be stored in that first part, the car, or the head of the cons pair in some sense. Now we have to link these together, and that will look exactly as we had before. So we'll have something that looks like this, and so forth in our linked list. But how will this beast actually be implemented? So let's look back to our storage model or our array, and these will also be numerical locations in our array of memory, some memory locations indexed by some index, say, i. So I'll make up some numbers here, and we'll see what this would look like. Here I'm just saying 2056. That's the location of the first of these two words. This is 4097. This is 10,521, and this is 624. And the way the singly linked list could be actually implemented here is we put a 4097 here, and a 10,521 here, and a 624 here, and so forth. And then we can chain forward through the array of memory to implement a singly linked list. We have these things. Now, there are two things, if you think about actual polygons, that are infelicitous about this implementation, as elegant as it is. Not a criticism of scheme, criticism of singly linked lists. And the first is that we have constant time access to the next element in the list by taking a cutter, taking a tail. We can always get to the next guy in constant time. That's really terrific. But we can't back up. Like if we're at 10,000, if we're at this guy here, we can't back up very easily. We have to think of something else. And that's not so great. So we might want to have something like a doubly linked list, which I will now implement for you. Um, that would be great. And the other thing that's infelicitous is if you look at an actual polygon in the real world, why does it have to stop at this fifth ver vertex? Like it has five entries there, right? The numbers are memory locations or array locations, answer to the question on the chat. So they're like, they're like, um, I here, whatever the index is. Think of them as addresses, but I, wanna, I don't want to really get into the details of how addresses are implemented in architecture. For the abstraction, here will be a memory array. So memory arrays have indices. Indices are addresses. They have contents and so forth. And I'm just making up numbers for them. So back to our, um, our polygon here, there's no reason. I mean, it's kind of strange. You get to the fifth thing and then it stops, but there is a next one, like the, the, the cutter of the of the fifth point is nil. Should actually be a circular list. So there are two things we'd like to extend, making lists doubly linked and also to make them circular. And we can do that and it has some consequences in terms of what we can know and what we can prove and how we can implement it. So the most straightforward way to implement a doubly linked list is to use three words of memory. Remember, we're only interested in finite things here. We can't store infinite things here. We can store something up to the size of the maximum address or size of the array. And conceptually, what we'll do with this, these extra words of memory, is we will point backwards instead. So this guy will point here. This guy will point here. This guy will point here. Of course, the arrows, as before, only go to the they go to the, the first word in this three word pair. And to reify that, make that a little bit clearer, the things we'll actually put uh, in here is a doubly linked list using three words of memory one for the data or pointer there too, like the coordinates x, y. The second will be the next thing, the next, next element, and the third will be a back pointer pointing before. And so now we have a wonderful structure, doubly linked list DLL implemented like this. And the nice thing about a doubly linked list is we have constant time access to the next, constant time access to the previous. And we can traverse this in either direction in a really fast way. And this is particularly useful if you wanna do things with polygons, as I will in the next lecture, such as add and delete points. So if I wanted to add something here, I could delete this point and add some other chain and just change all the pointers. So that would be a nice thing to be able to do. Now, 
This paradigm also extends to circular lists. So imagine a list that has no end where the last points to the first and the first points to the last. I can easily do that by adding, in this case, a fifth point. Remember, I'm drawing a pentagon that might look like this. So the fifth point looks just like all the other things. It has data in its first word like this. And it has a next pointer and it has a, has a um, back pointer as data five, whatever data five is. And conceptually, what I want to do here is I want to have this guy here point to 624. And this guy here point to 2056. And I change these other pointers as well. Obviously, this guy here, I need a number for this. Let's call this 1,000. This guy there is 1,023 like this. And then, of course, this guy here is 1,023. Now, drawing the pointers is a little tricky, but it can be done. Basically, this pointer here will point to this thing here. This back pointer here will point up there. Uh, this pointer here will point to this beast here. And this back pointer will put up there. And now I have a doubly, doubly linked list that is actually circular. And this nicely implements the concept of a polygon, namely a polygon has no end. You can keep going around and around and around. Uh, it's finite, but it, you can keep going with the pointers. It has basically five entries. And we have constant time access to the next and the previous. So this has a lot of uh, advantages. It's circular, so there's no artificial end, which is really nice. And of course, we have order one or constant time access to the next and previous points. Nevertheless, there's a huge downside to this implementation. Can anyone see what it is? In other words, it's wasteful in a certain sense. Any thoughts on this? It uses a lot of space. It does use a lot of space. That's exactly right. It's a very nice point. Um, so, uh, did I mess up the pointers? Next pointers? Oh yeah, these should be reversed, sorry. Thank you. Well, let's just relabel them. Let's call this one previous and this one next. It'll be fine. Um, thank you, Michaela. Uh, Michaela, that's great. Um, so it is wasteful because I've used a linear amount of space. So if I had an enormous polygon, I've used a linear amount of extra space to implement this. So here we have the algorithmic challenge I'd like to have you all think about, which is first one here. So. I mean, this is a memory model using addresses, if you will. I'm going to call it arrays, but it's fine. So using arrays, can you implement doubly linked lists using no additional space over singly linked lists? I don't mind constant space, but not constant space is fine. So in this model, we go back to our early way of thinking, early way of thinking about it. We have basically only two words per entry. Like that. And we have data, 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 data. And this guy, somehow these have to point to each other in some kind of fashion. So of course, you know, I'm just, just gonna draw it like that to indicate the direction, but it has to have back pointers as well. So we're only allowed to use two words and I'm still gonna have to do the data so you can't really do that. So what would our trick be? What would a trick be where I could implement the same functionality? You can, uh, you can ignore circularity for now, although we'll follow. I just wanna be able to have previous and next in constant time using some kind of mathematical or computational trick. And I wonder if you have any ideas about that, or if you'd like to ask any questions about how we would do it. So we're not allowed to use this third word. We have only this amount of space. How would we implement a doubly linked list using the same amount of space as a singly linked list, not having an increase which is sort of undesirable. So I'll let you think about that for a little bit. Feel free to ask any questions on the chat or ask me, ask your friend. We'll just keep everyone in the room here and see if there are any discussion. First of all, does everyone understand the question? If you'd like me to explain it more, I will. Um, 
So essentially what causes a doubly linked list to take up more space is just the two references. So one to the next, um, yeah, one to the next memory location and one to the previous one in comparison, saying, uh, in comparison to a uh, SLL. That's correct. Is that like, okay. All that's right. that's the increase. Yeah. So Paul, in answer to your question, you can't choose the addresses, but you can use these two words however you like, as long as everything's deterministic and you don't lose information. Is there a limit to how much space I have in the bottom um, memory location? Yes, all the memory locations, all the, all these words. Sorry, you kind of froze. So in other words, if your array is say a gigabyte, you want to be able to store roughly a billion things in there, address them all. Sorry, you froze up right there. Uh, could you repeat that real quick? Sorry, uh, thank you for letting me know that I froze. Yes, there is an upper limit. Um, it's whatever the size of memory is and you wanna be able to address all of it. So if you had a gigabyte, you'd wanna be able to address roughly a million things and you don't wanna lose, lose any of that space. And that is indeed what, what makes the problem hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there extra like bits of information in like our, our boxes over the amount of memory addresses we have? Because like, say we had like twice the amount of space we needed for the address, we could just concatenate them or something like that. Or like, I don't know, I guess some you kind of function. You absolutely could do that, except then you could only address half the memory. So yeah, you could split it up, but then, then you, so then, then you're, if you did that, you'd basically lose the ability to address half of your memory. Um, so that's a different kind of space wastage in some sense. So in this solution, we use an extra order n words for every linked list. In that solution, which of course is a very valid one to think about, you lose half of your memory. So if you bought a uh, computer with, you know, seven or 20 gigabytes, now you have only half that. So let me give you a hint, think about it. Well, actually, let me ask you a question because we don't actually build on this point. We know we can build circular lists. I will give you a choice. I am happy to let you think about this and we can do it at the beginning of class on Wednesday, or I'm happy to um, tell you the answer after maybe a hint. What would you like to do today? Mary, there you can imagine making the arrows bidirectional, but you have to implement it with actual instructions and pointers. So uh, I think that's what essentially we're trying to do. So what do you think? Do you all want to work on it some? Or now? I think we should go over it now, please. Okay. 
I can do a little more now. Absolutely reasonable. So let me give you a hint on how we might do this. So the questions we've had have been, you know, on the right track. So the basic problem is we're not going to be able to change the data because I don't want to lose data. I'm going to have to put some value here x, some value here y, right? Well, what should it be? Like, what should it be in order to make this work? So here's my hint. What if I chose x to be 84, 65, and y to be 47, 21? And of course, these have the same addresses, 205, 6, 4097, 10, 5, 21, and 624. And uh, I claim that solves the problem. I have to do that, of course, for the other ones too, but this is just an example. How does that help? So notice what I've done is I put another pretty big number in there, but it's of the same size, so that's fine. So I, my hint I would give is, I think Miriam had a really good point. I see this as, in the chat. I see this as essentially implementing her suggestion, but using numbers, not using a diagram. So what do you think of this? Wait, sorry. Uh, so is there a relationship between X and Y? Well, that's, that's for you to figure oh, out, okay, giving okay. you the hint. Right, so I've told you what actual numbers to put there, right? That's what I would do, but like, why does, how does it work and why does it work? Why does it solve the problem? There's a relationship between them and they're not arbitrary. In fact, they're determined, they're determined by these addresses. Yeah, Tommy, it's not exactly hashing. Good guess, though. The other thing is, this is actually the. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say there uh, sums are differences. It's a good guess. It's not, but it's in the right direction. So, Tommy, it's not hashing. One reason is this is actually a deterministic algorithm. Hashing is a very good probabilistic algorithm, but it's. I mean, it's guaranteed to give you the right answer, but it's not guaranteed to be fast. On practice, it is. So let's go with the sums or differences question. I think that was a very uh, perspicuous comment. Um, so what's the relationship between these? So let me sort of state it this way, we'll go into it. So notice these are the addresses of these locations. That, that is the address of the first one, we're treating them as pairs, basically. So one thing here I can tell you as a hint is X is equal to the exclusive or of 2056 and 1521. And similarly, Y is the exclusive or of 4097 and 624. So not exactly summation, but a different binary function. So first of all, does that hint help? And second, do you want to ask me any questions about the exclusive or function? Or any other question? What exactly does the exclusive or do with those two numbers? Yeah, yeah. So, um, Tommy, well, I think we'll come to your question in just a sec, but let me ask this question first. So let's look at XOR on bits. So I'll write it up as a table, right? So on just one bit, we could have a situation like this. And the input XOR of two number of two bits, bit could be zero and one, and its partner could be zero or one. So the exclusive OR table looks like this. Okay, is that good so far? I haven't answered your question, but I've started. Yep. Okay, let's look at something else. 
So when we say XOR, let's take a simple example of three and five. So the trick here is you write them down in binary, right? So three is zero, one, one, and five is one, oh, one. And what's the exclusive OR now, which you do bitwise? Six. Yeah, because it's one, one, oh, right? So in this case here, what we do is we take these numbers and we put them in binary and then we do a bitwise exclusive OR. It's also a function on your calculator. All right. So yeah, you can take XOR of natural numbers using this as a paradigm. All right, so how does this help us? So we had a very good comment from Miriam. Can you make the arrows bidirectional? So how does exclusive OR help you get bidirectional arrows? What, what's going on with that? Any ideas? So I guess this tells you how to get between what your, your previous and next were by just flipping whichever bits or ones. And then if you just save in your state, wherever you came from, then you can figure it out. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this does require an extra constant amount of space, but it's only one word. So I think you said it just right. Let me just restate it. And of course you can jump in if I didn't get it, but if we're traversing this list in the forward direction, so I just remember that I'm at 256, right? And when I get to 4,097, right? I then look at the, the pointer and I XOR that with where I was before, and I get 10,521. And I and we'll use this notation. Again, I'll use the notation I have here, which I did reverse in this case. We'll call this, this one here, we'll call this pointer next and this pointer previous, except I've got them backwards here, but that's not a problem. We have next and previous. So basically, if I'm looking at, say, x here, um, it's going to be the case that xor of x and previous equals next, and xor of x and next equals previous. So I can go in either direction. So for example, if I do, well, I've already done this example here. The example is, is uh, if I do xor of X and 2056, I get 10,521. If I do XOR of X and 10,521, I get back to uh, 2056. So I can go easily in either direction in this case. So I've encoded the bidirectional pointer using exclusive OR. And you need a little bit of logic there. You have to keep track of where you were before to do this, but you can clearly go in either direction with this. Okay. So in some ways, this is really quite remarkable, right? So using just a tiny bit of math, namely the math here that was requested, we just reduce the memory or space complexity of doubly linked lists by which is huge in architecture, right? And this actually has a name. This is called an XOR DLL, sometimes called XOR linking. And this was so powerful that in the 60s and 70s, the IBM 360, which was actually a computer I used when I was in high school taking classes at MIT, it took up an entire building, actually had this implemented into hardware so they could implement linked lists in hardware, which is pretty cool. Now, we had some very good suggestions about could you use addition and things like that. And another good question, I believe this one was from Tommy, which was, well, how do you reverse XOR? We call it invert, like think of an invertible function like F inverse and so forth. So 
we used XOR here, but actually we can use any invertible binary operator. We could use plus, we could use minus. Um, this is something you can prove. We could obviously prove it with XOR. Let me ask you a question though. Of plus and minus, we wouldn't, by the way, we wouldn't use multiplication because it doesn't have an inverse in the integers, right? You can't divide any two integers and get another integer, but plus and minus are on the table. So we have plus, minus, and XOR as candidates for the operation here to make Xs and Ys. Why is XOR the best choice? And by this is a very engineering answer. Why is XOR the best choice here? Well, it's just one logic gate as opposed to addition and I guess other operations, which might be more than one. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, I would, what I would say is, I rephrase what you say to say that you could do the, all the operations in parallel. Right, so I do need logic gates for each bit, but that you know, hardware is pretty cheap. So basically, I can do the XOR super quickly by doing them all at once. Um, and uh, with plus and, and minus, you have to like carry bits and stuff like that. You need a little more logic. It can't really be done in constant time. Um, so XOR is the, the method of choice here. So I think your answer is substantially correct. Okay. So kind of remarkable, just doing a little bit of thinking. And the notion we needed here was invertible function. So I'll say that this is the thing that comes up over and over again in mathematical computer science. So we have, you know, think of the, what function do I need? And the key question, which was posed by people in the class was, is it, you said reversible, which is like, is it invertible? Key thing to always ask about questions involving functions. And now you know the basis for addressing that. The other question you could ask is, if a function is easy to compute, is its inverse easy to compute? Something we will maybe come to a little bit later and it's a big topic at 3.30. All right. So now we can implement doubly linked lists if we wish using a smaller amount of space, which is really exciting. Now, let's go back to our example. Again, we're representing polygons here. So we have this polygon and it's circular. Now for the next example, it could be singly linked list. It could be doubly linked list. I don't actually care. I only need the properties of singly linked lists. So imagine we have something that is circular in the same fashion. And I'll just draw that again to imagine we have something that looks like this. So we have the polygon B, which of course is a pointer to our creature here, our pentagon. Again, it's perfectly fine if we make this doubly or single. I'll just draw it singly because that's all I need for this example, but it could easily be double. So imagine B is our DLL or SLL as before. And we want to know something about the properties of functions if we pass them this polygon. So let's look at something like the length function, which you have implemented and used. And suppose I ask if length is safe on B. What happens when I call length on B? Remember, this is just a regular box and pointer diagram, right? I just drawn it a little bit differently. The difference is I now have a pointer that goes like this, All right? So what happens when I ask to take the length of this? What happens? Um, never ends like uh, running. I'm sorry, Miriam has a correct answer. I'm afraid that um, you broke up a little bit. Did you say, want to just repeat? Oh, like it will never end, finish running, like same as Miriam. It would never end, right? So you don't actually have safe, but it's not safe. So if you had safe, it would be false. And we can still ask the question if it's safe. And similarly for copy and similarly for last. So all of these functions would run forever, right? So this is a little disconcerting. Right, we had all these nice functions that operated on lists, and now we can make circular lists. But even the most rudimentary functions like length, copy, and safe 
would run forever. Now, this is a little bit of a strange way to say it because we're assuming I'm writing down state, which doesn't exist. So we could also just say length of B is equal to Scott's bottom, namely it never returns. So circular lists are cool, but you have to be really careful, right? And the reason is that some functions that are designed to work on linear lists that terminate in nil are not going to behave very well. So we handle this formally because these functions are really just defined on proper lists. Proper list is something that if you keep tailing it, you'll eventually get the empty list. And here we never get the empty list. So from a formal point of view, we're mathematically sound. But nevertheless, introducing a circular list is very disconcerting because all of a sudden some of our procedures can run forever. So how can we deal with such a creature? The two issues are safety. And of course we have issues of efficiency. So how can we write safe procedures on things that can be circular? And how can we write procedures that can be efficient on such things? Okay. All right. So in short, if we want to act, we might have singly or doubly linked lists, which are fine. We might make them circular because they don't actually have an end they keep going around. But when you do, you get something very powerful representationally, but all of a sudden lots of things might not work very well like length, copy, and last. Okay. And of course, we saw some pretty cool things looking at these binary bitwise operations implement doubly linked lists. Okay. So how do we deal with some of these issues of safety? And we'll also look at efficiency here. So it's a little bit disconcerting. What you might want to do is have a function that checks whether or not the thing you're passing in is a circular structure. Right? That would be nice, because if you could check that, you could make sure it was, so to speak, a nicely formed structure that your function could be handled before you called length or copy or last on it. And that would be really terrific. So let's see how we might do a thing like that. Um, so first of all, I want to start getting into how I would actually make a thing like this. So how would you actually make a creature like this in Ski? Uh, and I'm not going to show you how we do mutations in Ski. So let's look at a simple example. To find the list L to be list one, two, three. All right, so just like my example here, except that I only have three things, not five. So I have one, two, three, and this is gonna be nil, and L points to this. So you're all familiar with this, you've done this a lot. So how would we do a thing like this where we change the cutter of the last element to point to the first, how would that actually look? So in older schemes and older lists, you would say something like this. You'd say set cutter bang last L to be L. Sort of a strange thing, let me help you parse this. So the last element of L you know the last function, last element L is here. So last points to this object here. The cutter of that is clearly this part of the cons pair. So what we do by this command is we get our hands on the last element of L and we set this pointer to be L itself, which is this beast. Now you might say, oh, that's great. He's told me some things. What's this strange exclamation point? Well, in scheme, we know that mutations and side effects, and this is a mutation, you're mutating the list, right? You're changing it. They're extremely dangerous. They break the substitution model. They're harder to reason about. All sorts of things happen, but still they can be useful. So any of these dangerous operations like this one, what we do is we put a bang to tell you this is dangerous calling mutation, set cutter exclamation point. And of course there's a set car as well. And this is how you do it. Furthermore, Racket has an additional safety feature. You could not actually mutate any of the lists you've made up to now in the class because they're defined technically to be immutable. 
list, lists that you cannot change or mutate. And in order to actually do this thing that I have described, you have to make a new thing called a mutable list. And it has operations like set m cutter, mutable cutter, and m last. So in other words, the things you make with list cons and take apart with car and cutter cannot ever be changed. Racket will not let you do it. But there's a corresponding series of dangerous operations, which you can use sometimes, called mcons, mcar, and mcutter, and the corresponding setters set mcutter and set mcar that allow you to do this. They have this. And they're a different data structure. They're a data structure which you're allowed to mutate. So again, the substitution model no longer applies with mutations, and you must replace it with the environment model covered in Abelson and Sussman, but not in this class. Nevertheless, despite the fact that we now have these dangerous operations that are somewhat harder to understand, and you can do anything you want by setting and cropping these pointers, in Scheme, it is impossible to have pointers mutations. It's part of the design, and you can prove this, which is amazing. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some code in a minute. Actually, you know, this is just a little bit of code. I'll show you some real code. So now we can make circular lists, things like this, like this, and like this, and we can imagine doing something. So I'm going to ask you a question now. This is a popular interview question. And what I found is that generally 1% of the class to 2% have seen this. And I kind of don't want to test recall, right? I don't want to test whether you've heard it before. Um, so if you know it, you can email me and I will be impressed that you know it, but um, I'd rather maybe if you already have seen it, you don't take away fun for other people who are trying to solve the problem. The other thing I'll do is I'll break this down. I want to come up with stepping stones and that will let us exercise our algorithm design abilities. So can we come up with a predicate that takes a list as input and tells you whether or not it's circular? So, and circular means something like this, this or this. So I imagine I want a thing that says circular and I take in something like B and I want this to return true. And I take in some thing that's linear, I, you fall off the end with nil and it returns false. And that would be something I could use to tell it something is circular so I wouldn't take the length copy or last of it. I would do something special there. So let's look at a case like this. How would you determine that such a creature was circular using just what we know in scheme? Any ideas? And also you can ask any clarifications about how we've set it up or the problem. Um, so one question, so I, I sort of had two like conflicting thoughts. First, um, in the find path algorithm we wrote on one of the problem sets, um, I did it by storing a, essentially a list of previously seen values. Um, and so whenever you see a value that you've previously seen, you kind of assume that you're in a cycle. Um, but the sort of conflicting thought I had is, how would this not violate the halting problem in some way because you're essentially saying like either this is an infinite loop or it quote unquote halts and is a list if that makes sense no this does not violate the halting problem uh because as you found out you're able to i mean you're asking you're asking if a particular function would run forever but it's a very special special function but really i'm just asking you if the list is circular it's a byproduct that it would actually um you know, terminate. Um, so great question to see a connection with the halting problem. So I couldn't say, I can't solve, I can't say that every function or an arbitrary function is safe when you give it a circular or non-circular list. But I could tell you that the length function is safe. And essentially I'm just reducing that to the question of is it actually circular? So I think your idea of how to do this with respect to, um, I mean, I think your concept of how to do this with respect to the graphs was kind of the right one. So how could you change those ideas in order to um, 
to solve this problem? Like, because that was definitely, I think, on the right track. So tell me, have I convinced you this isn't the halting problem? Yes, yes. Um, I, it, I I kind of figured it was possible. I just had that idea, and I wanted to just ask to make sure this wasn't some kind of weird so, case. And also, if you were going to be be a stickler about it, which you're entitled to do as a mathematician, you could say, I just don't see it. Can you prove it? And then once once we write the code down, I, I would be able to do that. But um, go ahead. Um, so can we assume that the can we assume that the different nodes have different data? Like, do we have any reason to assume that um, if we see one, two, or three, we can't see them a second time? That's a great question. Uh, no, you can't assume that the, you cannot assume that the data are distinct, but you do have access to the addresses. Yeah. So for example, um, let me give you, let me think about this. Suppose I were to look at, um, uh, I take L, And suppose I were to um, cutter of this. Remember, it's mutable cutter, so m cutter, right? And I could ask, for example, if m cutter of L is equal to L, right? I can use the eq function, which says, do they have the same address, right? So this might be a silly thing to do. So you can compare these pointers, basically. Remember that the basically that compares this pointer to this pointer in some sense. So remember the m m cutter or the cutter is gonna be this pointer here, and L is this pointer here. So it's you're asking a good question, but you don't need to look at the data. You could actually look explicitly at, at basically the addresses, which are these pointers instead. Um, I guess you could use um, a map to kind of compare the addresses of everything with everything else. Uh, um, no, never mind. Um, I was thinking, if a cycle will cover every element every single time, maybe you just store the memory address of the very first element. And if you see that memory address again, you call it a cycle? Yes. I think that's the most efficient solution. Um, so let me just rephrase. I mean, first one list, if you ever get to nil, then you know the list is not circular. If you ever encounter this again, then you know that it's circular and you return true. And this algorithm that you've described is actually a constant space linear time algorithm. So it requires one storage location to remember the head, and then you have to traverse the list. So if it's a linear list, then you have to look at every element. And if it's a circular list, you have to wait to come around to the beginning and it takes order n or n plus one steps as well. So that's a great job. We now have a pretty efficient algorithm. I mean, how could you do better than constant space? And linear time is reasonable because how do you know without looking at the entire list? But at this point, it might help because I want to ask you some more you know, complicated questions. We're doing great, by the way. I want to actually show you what some of this code looks like. I'll put this on the web. I'll let you think about it a little bit. All right. So. How do we actually do this? I mean, take some steps here. Uh, let me answer Vanessa's question. Vanessa, you don't have to store all the memory locations. You only have to store one location, which is the, which is the um, first one. And then as you put your things down, you don't have to store anything. I mean, of course, they already are stored because you have the list, but you don't have to use additional space. Um, so I don't have to allocate any, any additional space beyond what I have. Um, Let's see. No, great, great question. You know, okay. So let's look at what this might look like here. So I got to do some some things here, right? I I have mutable lists here that are built in, and I'm going to use some of my usual ways of thinking about this. So I have accumulator, old friend, and I have to be able to make these things. So I have m cons, which is my analog of cons. M cons makes a mutable list, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just basically have a function that changes lists to mutable lists by accumulating them. So I make all these mutable lists. A, B, and C are, the, are just mutable lists, three copies of one to 10, right? Now I need a last function, but it has to work on mutable lists. I can't use my regular last because I have to use mcar and mcutter. So I write last again to be m last. So now I can get the last element of a list. And now I can do some fun things. I can, you know, obviously I can look at list A and take its mcar. Um, I can take, uh, 
I can't use last because last isn't defined on mutable lists. Why? Because if we use car and cutter, which aren't the right accessors for lists that aren't mutable. But mlast works just fine. mlast gives me the 10 at the end, which is what I want. And of course, I can continue to mcutter these things. If I do nine mcutters, I get the list 10, which is the last, last list here. I've repeated as usual, which is I'm going to use here. So instead of writing this here, I can do repeated mcutter nine, and I get back the last con cell. All right. So it's, I have mcons, mcutter, and mcar instead of cons, car, and cutter. And I wrote my own M list, which just converts lists to mutable lists like this. Okay. Now let's do something fun like we had before. So I can just as before I can make a list circular. So I'm just reifying this example here for our list of one to 10. Remember if I M cutter this guy down here, um, if I M cutter down nine times, sorry about that. If I M cutter down nine times, I get the last con cell in the list, which is 10. So now what I can do is I can set that. So look here, I have my repeated mcutter nine that gets the last element in the list. I do set mcutter of that to be A, and now the last, last con cell in the list points back to the first. This is exactly what we did here, but I'm just doing it um, you know, with repeated function instead. And so now A virtually scheme knows about circular lists. So you try to print it, it gives you this infinite repeat with the dot, 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 it starts like that, which is kind of cool. But mlast will run forever because it never finds the last. So mlast is an example of a non-safe function on a circular list. Here's the algorithm your colleague just suggested implemented in scheme. So it's constant time, I'm sorry, constant space, but linear time. I've just implemented like this. The key thing here, we just keep track of the beginning and we compare it to every cell there. We either fall off the end of the list here, getting null, or we come back and get the beginning again. And here, what's pretty cool about this is let's look at our examples here. So what we've done here is we have um, made, so thing is, you may be confused by this and this is, and you should be because mutations are scary confusing, even though they're very useful. I've made A to be a linear list. And look here, I've even printed out A to be a, be a nice list. But once I make this mutation, it's now an infinitely circular list. And so B on the other hand here has not been cyclized or circular. So when I run my circular try function here on the B function, it says nicely, no, it's not circular because it's linear. I run it on A, A has been cyclized, so A is now circular, but this function nicely detects this. Okay, so now we're in good shape. We have some functions and they're pretty efficient. And what they can do is they can test whether or not our cycles here are really cycles. So in other words, before calling functions like last, copy, or length, what we can do instead is we could uh, test them first if they're circular and only try them in that case. However, there's a problem, and I think it was just brought up in the chat. Um, uh, and the problem is that these particular kind of circular lists have a very special structure, namely that you come back to the head of the list, right? But there's another class of lists, which is also called circular in computer science, which are called row lists. And this is the Greek letter row, and you'll see why I call it row. And they look like this. I'll draw my consoles as circles now because I don't really need the pointers. They look like this. So they have a cycle, but it's not at the beginning. And I think that my colleague will be happy to concede that the function that he proposed, which I was hoping would not work on this, because the function that was proposed, which is also this function right here, will fail. And the reason is it stores as begin a pointer to this node here, which is actually the entry point. And so what the algorithm does is it cutters down the list, hoping to either find nil or to find something that matches the beginning and it never happens. So circular try or function here is going to fail on row lists, things that are, are cyclic lists like this or circular lists 
but they have this tail on there. So they look like the Greek letter row on the side like this. So first, let me ask, do you understand why circular tri will fail here? Namely that it only stores the head, only compares that to every other node and it won't detect this case. And then we can go on to try to solve this problem here. Good, makes sense? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so my question was kind of like, if you were looking previously at like the perfect circle, whatever, with a list that was like mm -hmm. one, two, three, one, five, whatever, wouldn't that fail? Um, because even though it's a um, non-circular list, because um, there's the first element is in the list again. It's not looking at the data. It's looking at the pointer to the console. Oh, okay, gotcha. So that was, that was a great, great question. But yeah, the data can be arbitrary. Um, yeah, if we just looked at the data, we would be in trouble. But we're looking at, the nice thing is that EQ is actually comparing addresses. It's actually telling you whether or not you have the same object. And that generally means the same address, basically. So great question. Okay. And so, and I'll, I'll put this on for you all to look at here, but basically the, the, in this case here, what I've been able to do is I've been able to make a row list. So notice instead of doing repeated M could or nine, I've done it only up to five. So basically I make a cycle starting here. So repeated M could or five is just six or 10 here. What I do is I basically, uh, set the encoder of this guy here, this list here, to be um, repeated encoder five. So now I get a list that repeats like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then the six, seven, eight, nine, ten repeats infinitely. So I have this weird thing here like this. Scheme is very nice. It notices that and just gives it like that. So circular try on this new function, this new thing B here, will run forever, which is undesirable. And finally, let me talk more about the difficulties of mutations. So look up here, we all had a very happy time. We said, look, A is circular. So circular try does a great job, says circular. B is linear, so it says it's false. But now we've mutated B and now circular try never halts, right? So once you introduce mutations, the point at which you evaluate an expression in the flow of your source code matters tremendously because the data structure has changed. So in a functional program, if circular try B is false, it will be false in the future. It will be false in the past. It'll be false until eternity. But once you have mutations, it's possible that it may never halt or give a different answer entirely. And the reason is the value B has changed. So mutations are incredibly powerful. You can do all sorts of things with them but they're really, really dangerous. So with great power comes great responsibility. I quote Spider-Man again. And I think that mutations are something that you now are ready to use. Now that you know some mathematics and computer science in a rigorous sense. Um, and I hope you will enjoy the fruits of these mutational functions like set cutter and set car bang. Uh, just be careful not to get the fruit all over your clothes. And that's what can happen if you're not careful. So circular try V will run forever and fail. So the question is, and I put it here is, can we devise a circular try that really works well? Some kind of circular function that works well even on row lists. And again, as I mentioned, a few people have seen this, so I wanna do it in stages. And these are all interesting algorithm design problems because each one of them is pretty cool. So the first question is, um, I want to have circular work on lists that can be even row lists, all lists, including row lists. And the first thing I'd like is I'd like an algorithm and order n squared time. So it should take in any list. It could be a linear list. It can be a truly circular list. It can be a row list. It should run in order n space and order n squared time. How would we do such a thing? What would that algorithm look like? 
what do you think? And feel free to ask any clarifying questions. Is the problem well defined? All that kind of stuff. Would you just keep a list of all previous values instead of just the first one? And that's why it's O of n space. That's right. Now, why would it be order n squared time though? Because for each successive element in the list you're iterating through, you'd have to check all of the previous ones. So for each element of n, you check through n elements. Yes, absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better myself. So just to rephrase, you keep a list of every element you've seen. And whenever you do a next, that is a, a, an M coder, you compare it against the list, have I seen it before? Similar to your problem set before and involving find path and so forth. And of course, that takes linear time. In fact, it takes, it's a, the reason it does is that you're looking at the a sum here, right? Your list grows. So we have the sum for i, for i equals one to n, right? So this thing, this this is why it's n squared basically, it grows up. So your, your time here, your space is only linear, but your running time is gonna be n squared because first you look at the, you know, you look at one, then you look at two, then you look at three, you look at four and so forth. So we have an, a linear space quadratic time algorithm, which is pretty cool. All right. Now. Here's an advanced question. Can we do linear space and better than order n squared time? Any ideas about how we would do that? Um, what if we kind of used sets? I'm, I'm not sure if that can work. You know, I think you have a good idea there. So the question will be about how quickly can you access the sets and look things up, right? Yeah. And so, so would you use, would you like to use ordered sets or unordered sets? Um, ordered sets. Yes. So I think that's essentially the answer uh, that I, I, I think you basically got the right idea. So if you were to put these in a binary tree, right? So you'd have to make sure you kept the tree balanced or make some assumption about the distribution of the addresses. And that was Paul's question initially, can you assume anything with the distribution of addresses? So if I don't know anything with the distribution, distribution of addresses, Statistically, then what I'd have to do is rebalance the tree occasionally. That can be done, although it's a bit of bookkeeping. If I assume a uniform or Gaussian distribution of the addresses, then I can be more or less sure that the tree is more or less balanced. And when it's balanced, I can get to the bottom of the tree in logarithmic time. So I can insert things and I can look up things in logarithmic time. So that means that my lookup time here, instead of being quadratic, will be n log n. So it's Relatively straightforward to get this to n log n, but it's a bit of bookkeeping. So um, good, good suggestion of sets, good suggestion from Paul about distributions. You should know that there are binary trees that are deterministic, namely if you do bookkeeping to rebalance the tree. There are also binary trees that are probabilistic, namely you rely on a distribution to assume that things aren't given in some horrible order with high probability, and therefore your tree will be more or less balanced. So the binary tree to the rescue here. So n log n is much better than n squared. We still need linear space to do this. So sort of great ideas. So what I'd like to do, and we won't do it now, but I'd like to leave it for you to think about for next time, let's write it, write it on here in a piece of paper, is the little challenge, and I'll do it at the beginning of, I will definitely do this at, at the beginning of class on Wednesday, we'd like you to think about it, is for this thing here, I wanna say for all lists, and these could be linear, they could be circular and they could be row lists. Any of these lists like this, I wanna write circular of L. And again, 
n to be will be the size of l here, and it have the usual spec. But I want this to run in constant space and order n time. So this is a tricky problem, but the things you would use to do this are not trickier than the things that you all already solved. So if you'd like to work on this problem, I will ask you how you did and what you came up with on um, Wednesday. I'll post the code here just in case you want to look at it to see what this, this code looks like. I'll post that on the website now, uh, which poses this question. So I'll ask what you came up with. And also, if you would like to discuss the problem on Piazza or to send me an email, I'm happy to discuss it with you before then. I don't think your note has to be, well, maybe it should be private unless you really want to give away the answer. Um, so happy to talk to you about it. This is an interesting problem. And obviously this is the best you can do. You can't do better than linear space and it would be very unlikely you could have an algorithm that doesn't have to look at everything in the list. But a little bit surprising, right? We had to really work hard to find something that was linear time quadratic space and then use some pretty fancy stuff like binary trees and stuff to get down to n log n time. And I had to you know, argue that that was possible. So to get this down even further requires a little bit of thought in algorithm design. So uh, we'd like to do this and then I will try to apply these to other problems in geometry and particularly in robotics in the next, next two lectures. Let me, so in other words, try to solve this, talk to me about it if you like, uh, we certainly will cover this at the beginning of Wednesday's lecture and I will ask you for your solutions and you can tell me about them. If you'd like to send them beforehand, that's fine too. So let me make one more comment. These kind of puzzles are pretty interesting. In our case, they illuminate the difference between um, data structures with mutations and data structures without mutations. They point out some of the powerful but unusual things you get in to reason about and changing the correctness of your programs depending on mutations. And finally, they go back to our, our idea here that we need to have different, if you will, semantics, different ways of thinking about different modes of programming. In other words, in functional programming, we have substitution and induction. With side effects, we have the environment model. We need to think very carefully about it. We still can use induction, but it builds in substitution. And then of course, we might have algorithms that either flip coins or take advantage of probabilistic distributions. And the theory and development of each of these is that it, is it, it's at least as involved as a substitution model. But now that you've seen one set of semantics, you probably will have little trouble picking it up. So we're gonna concentrate on here with a little digression into here. So I will say, this is a fun problem. Try to solve it for Wednesday. I think that our interaction for those of you who are interested is similar to what happens in a coding interview, like you would be probably at a whiteboard or a tablet and you'd be solving problems and answering questions that were posed to you by hopefully friendly interviewer who could disambiguate things and ask questions, maybe give hints and watch how you were doing this. And I think you all did really well. We got to, um, uh, through all the algorithms, there was someone who had really good answers to each one, often several people. So I think you're all set up to use what you've learned uh, to go out into the world. And these are also similar to questions you'll see in CS330. So the next two lectures, I wanna apply these ideas not only to solving this problem, but how we can do some geometry problems and computational algorithm design problems that relate more, say robotics and have some more puzzles as well. So with that, I want to, uh, uh, stop the recording. We're slightly beyond our time, I believe. Uh, what are we in terms of time? And yeah, we're 446. So I'm going to stop the recording for now, and but I'm going to stay around. And if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, answer them. And I'll stay until uh, you all 